I'm Tamsin Lewis. Like Lucy, I'm an early music practitioner specialising in early modern English repertoire. I direct the early music ensemble Passamezzo and have written a number of books on 16th and 17th century music in its historical context. In my talk, I'll look at theatre during the interregnum, focusing on the Red Bull Theatre and on the Rump Drolls and the humour of John Swabber in particular. Both Singing Simpkin and the humour of John Swabber are first found in a book named Acteon and Diana. This is a collection of conceited humours, or short one-act plays, put together by the actor Robert Cox. Acteon and Diana was first printed in 1656, during a time when the theatres were officially closed and performances had to be given secretly. In 1642, Parliament issued an ordinance for the suppression of the theatres and decreed that public stage plays shall cease and be forborne. This act was repeated in 1647 and in 1648, this last with the threat of flogging for the actors and a fine of five shillings for each audience member. However, the very repetition of the bill implies that it was not being heeded and while most of the main playhouses did close, and indeed some were physically destroyed by soldiers, the Red Bull Theatre survived and managed to give performances throughout the interregnum. This illustration from Francis Kirkman's book, The Wits, is thought by some to show the stage of the Red Bull Playhouse. The Red Bull was an inn-yard theatre, surrounded by galleries on three sides, and situated in Clerkenwell, just outside the walls of London. It is described as being equal in size to the globe and partially open to the weather, and very popular. Known as much for jigs as for plays, as this quote from The Careless Shepherdess, an anonymous play from 1630 illustrates, I'll go to the bull, or fortune, and there see a play for tuppence, and a jig to boot. During the Commonwealth, the theatre couldn't advertise openly that there would be plays, but they could publicise the type of events that were not currently banned. Things like rope dancing and country dancing, and maybe a performance by a clown or a conceited fellow. Francis Kirkman's book, The Wits, was first printed in 1662. It's a collection of jigs and rolls said to have been performed during these times. He gives a good description of the situation in his preface. When the public theatres were shut up, then all that we could divert ourselves with were these humours and pieces of plays, which, passing under the name of a merry conceited fellow called Bottom the Weaver, Simpleton the Smith, John Swabber, or some such title, that but by stealth too, under pretence of rope dancing or the like. A short digression. This rope dancing was itself quite spectacular. John Wright, one of the actors at the Red Bull Theatre, describes a rope dancer known as the Turk in his ballad, a new song on the Turkish artist which is lately come into England, which danceth on a rope eight and thirty feet from the ground. The ballad survives in Wit's Interpreter, printed in 1655. It is lengthy and full of the racial prejudices of the time, but these few verses give an idea of the Turk's virtuosity. On a slope in court he'll go, you shall see, even from the very ground, full sixty foot high, where I would not be, though you'd give me thousand pounds. First he stands and makes faces and looks down below. Put a hat twelve foot four, each could not do so. By my troth, I'd never make ballad more. But yet he shall be a Turk. One may not venture high with him to dwell. He has rapiers at his feet and a maypole in his fist so cruel. You'd bless yourself. Though his cap 
be green, his breeches be red, he'll stand on a pole atop of his head. To see him do all, he'd bring you to bed, but yet he shall be a Turk. There's a story yet untold, you'll hardly believe it when you hear it, and a wonderful one it is to behold. As a kind of habit to hoy, tied to his feet, God give joy. She swings as high as the walls of Troy, but yet he shall be a Turk. When he's above us, we are below him, yet wish not ourselves together. We dare not hazard a leg or a limb for cracking a parcel of either, but he the predominant lord of the court domineers o'er oh, the peasant, the knight, and the lord, and honestly shows fair play above board, but yet he shall be a Turk. Another account of the Turk's acrobatic skills comes from the diarist John Evelyn writing about a visit to the Red Bull in 1657 to see a famous rope dancer called the Turk. I saw, even to astonishment, the agility with which he performed. He walked barefooted, taking hold by his toes only of a rope almost perpendicular, and without so much as touching it with his hands. He danced blindfold on the high rope, and with a boy of twelve years tied to one of his feet about twenty feet beneath him, dangling as he danced. Yet he moved as nimbly as if it had been but a feather. Lastly, he stood on his head on the top of a very high mast, danced on a small rope that was very slack, and finally flew down the perpendicular on his breast, his head foremost, his legs and arms extended, with diverse other activities. This, then, was the sort of entertainment that accompanied the stage plays at the Red Bull during the Interregnum. Fear of interruption and discovery meant that an entire play was too long to be safe, so a new form of drama had to be devised, creating short playlets from cut-down versions of favourite scenes, usually comical. Francis Kirkman's The Wits contains a number of these, including some Shakespeare pieces, Bottom the Weaver, mentioned above, from A Midsummer Night's Dream, and The Gravediggers, from Hamlet. Kirkman calls these short comic plays drolls, or rump drolls, due to the date of their performance, and explains that although they may not seem much to us now, they were exceedingly popular, and in his opinion, superbly acted. These small things were as profitable as any of our late famed plays. I have seen the Red Bull Playhouse, which was a large one, so full that as many went back for want of room as had entered, and as meanly as you may think these drolls, they were then acted by the best comedians then and now in being, and, I may say, by some exceeded all now living. This example from an edition of the Royalist news sheet Mercurius Democritus, printed on the 9th of June 1653, shows how these drolls were advertised in a roundabout way, as part of a sort of variety show. At the Red Bull in St John's Street on Thursday next, being the 9th of June 1653, there is a pretty conceited fellow that hath challenged the dromedary lately come out of Barbary to dance with him cap a pee on the low rope, as also running up a board with rapiers and a new country dance called the horn dance never before presented, performed by the ablest persons of that civil quality in England. There will also appear a merry conceited fellow which hath formerly given content and you may come and return with safety. The play to be performed is not described, but on this occasion we have more information from a few weeks later. 
the 22nd of June edition of Mercurius Democritus names the interlude performed and tells us that the performance did not go ahead as smoothly as planned. The rope dancers, having employed one Master Cox, an actor, a very honest though impoverished man, who is not only as well as others put by the practice of his calling but charged with a poor wife and five helpless infants to present a modest and harmless jig called Swabber. Yet two of his own quality, envying their poor brother should get a little bread for his children, basely and unworthily betrayed him to the soldiers, and so abused many of the gentry that formerly had been their benefactors, who were forced to pay to the soldiers five shillings apiece for their coming out, as well as for their going in. So, theatre-going could be a perilous and expensive activity at this time. It's believed that the Master Cox mentioned above in Mercurius Democritus is the actor Robert Cox. Kirkman describes him as incomparable and says that he pleased city, country and university alike. Cox was also the author or compiler of Actium and Diana, the collection of short comic plays that I mentioned earlier. And we believe that the harmless jig called Swabber is the humour of John Swabber from this collection. It's a play about the sailor, John Swabber, whose wife, Parnell, has betrayed him with Cutbeard, the barber, while he is away at sea. During the course of the play, Swabber is tricked in various ways by Cutbeard and Parnell, and the two men are themselves manipulated by the gentlemen Francisco and Gerardo. Swabber has many elements in common with Singing Simpkin. It's a bawdy comedy with recognisable stock characters, including a credulous cuckolded husband and a faithless deceitful wife, as well as some truly ludicrous plot twists. However, despite being described in Mercurius Democritus as a harmless jig, Swabber is not a jig, but a droll, as described by Kirkman above where jigs were written in rhyming verse with the words sung to ballad melodies, drolls were written in prose and had few musical directions. Swabber doesn't contain much in the way of musical directions, but like many other drolls, it ends with a dance for which musicians are brought onto the stage. Given that instrumentalists were engaged for the play, it seems likely that they would have found more to do such as providing small pieces of incidental music to mark changes of scene or the entrance or exit of a character. Given the nature of the drolls, it is also probable that the music used would have been well known, ballad melodies or dance tunes, rather than anything specifically composed for the occasion. Although these tunes are less familiar to us today, they were the popular songs of their time and their meanings and associations, as well as their melodies, would be well known to many of those listening to the play. So, to find appropriate music to frame the scenes of our performance, I looked for tunes associated with barbers and sailors, particularly cuckolded sailors, and came across a mid-17th century broadside ballad. The Crafty Barber of Deptford, which is about a man who goes away to sea and is cuckolded by a barber just what happens in the humour of John Swabber. The ballad says, But he, poor man, was gone to see, and little did he think, sir, that his poor wife would wanton be, and with the barber drink, sir. This detail shows the melody direction given on the ballad sheet of the crafty barber. As you can see, it says, Tune of Daniel Cooper. We don't know who Daniel Cooper might have been, but a melody of that name is found in later editions of Clayford's Dancing Master, and it fits the metre of the ballad. So we've used that melody for Cutbeard, and played it on the cittern, as this was an instrument associated with barbers and their shops, where citterns would hang for the use of waiting customers. Other music choices include a tune called The Sailor's Delight for Swabber's Wife Parnell, and a simple lute song lullaby for the baby. 
There is a tune and a dance called the Red Bull, which was associated with the theatre from the 1620s onwards. The music survives in various late 17th century sources, and this image comes from Playford's Dancing Master. I've used this Red Bull melody to frame the play, as this seems appropriate for something that was performed there. A final note. In these times, plays tended to be costumed very plainly rather than in any fantastical way. This was due to the constant danger of being interrupted by soldiers who would be likely to confiscate the actors' costumes with or without the actors in them. Kirkman writes about this, quoting Fletcher. Enter the red coat, exit hat and cloak. He says this was very true, not only in the audience, but the actors too were commonly not only stripped, but many times imprisoned, till they paid such ransom as the soldiers would impose upon them, so that it was hazardous to act anything that required any good clothes. Kirkman's assertion is borne out in a report from January 1650 in another royalist periodical, The Man in the Moon, describing a raid on the Red Bull when the soldiers seized on the poor players, uncased them of their clothes, disarmed the lords and gentlemen of their swords and cloaks, and hung the poor players' clothes upon their pikes, and very manfully marched away with them as trophies of so wonderful a victory. Following this advice, our actors are dressed very simply in plain 17th century costume. Swabber wears a sailor's thrum cap, and now, without further ado, we present to you the humour of John Swabber. And a cuckold of one that, for all I know, might have 
maid a courtier, for which abominable deed I scorn to show myself a Christian, for I mean to use him worse than a Jew would. Nay, but consider he's a man of honor, and you can boast to yourself to be no more, although you have the spirit of a giant. You have brought weapons here if you meant to kill him twenty times. Troth, tis too much. If I bait him an ace of forty, call me coxcomb. I will draw his teeth. One by one with an instrument called the pair of tongs. Then let him blood in the right vein, and let the devil take him at his own peril. Let me prevail with thee to calm thy rage. And take acquaintance of this gentleman, a worthy friend of mine. Do you long to be acquainted with me, sir? By any means, sir. It is granted, then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll toss a, a camera pop with you as soon as I've dispatched this body father. Would he forget that my business might be over? Uh, what is your profession, sir, and how may I call you? I'm a seaman, sir, and my name is John Swabber. An officer in the ship, sir. I cry in mercy, sir. <laughs> oh, never cry for the matter. But I've forgotten this barber all this while. Barber! Come forth! For by the beard of my great grandfather, I swear I shall Oh, Shashado, Mashado, and Carbinado, thee that thou shalt look like a gallimaufry of the days of thy life. Come forth, I say! Why, Mary Swabber? Who provokes you that? What do you mean? Who has offended you? Oh, slave of slaves, who has offended me? Why, the base, beastly, boisterous, Babylonian, body-faced barber, thou hast! Thou hast made me fit to chew the cud with oxen, climb the mountains with wild goats, and keep company with none but ram-headed people. For the which I will tie thee up to the next signpost, where thou shalt hang a twelve month and a day alive, as an example to all such notable shaders. But if thou comest and submits to my mercy, I'll do thee a favour and let thee hang there till thou be dead. Francisco, come on. I'll draw my life that this fellow is a rash coward, a he who is fury hard, and I'll persuade the father to a greater vein of glory than e'er was practised by a suburb of blade. I'll make him at the very least seem valiant. Fear not. To do it would be possible. I'll hold him in discourse. <laughs> but Mr. Swabber, what think you if he does compound with you? Will you be one to take an arm or two, or both his legs, and save his other members? <laughs> Finish, tell not me. Tis neither his arms nor his legs that I stand upon. He has caused me to go in danger of my life. For to the day I had occasion to pass by a worshipful gentleman's pack of hounds. They no sooner looked upon my forehead, but they came at me in full cry, and I, for fear, left such a ascent behind me, they came after me as perfectly by as if I had been a stag. And if I had not got shelter of a house without doubt I'd have been presented to some great man for venison, and my haunches have been baked all this time. You were in danger there, I must confess. And the butcher's dogs still take me for a bull, and fetch such courses at me. And all this the barber is the cause of. I would revenge it if I were you. He should not have a tool left him to work with. No, nor to play with, neither. Out of every inch of every tool he has. Barber, come forth, and let me kill thee upon fair terms, or else I will enter this house by force, pitch thee down the stairs, and send thee to Benaren headlong. 
And if thou dost submit to my mercy, I'll shake thee to death with thy own razor. Therefore take heed. No, let him come if he dare. Well, now I see there is no hope to appease him. Blood must ensue, and death will take its course. <laughs> with, with who? What's the matter? Oh, uh, the barber uh, is preparing for the combat. Uh, he has took his pole to serve him for a lance, and one of his basins for a butler, and he vows to make you the windsman, whilst he plays Don Quixote against you. Seriously. A windmill? Mm -hmm. I'll be gone. You will not over that for short. Who? Afraid? Uh, would it not make anyone tremble at the thought of it? First to be made a cuckold, then a windmill? No. I'll be gone and come again when I can kill him, uh, when I can find him in a better humour. Consider what you do. He'll call you coward. Proclaim you cuckold still in every alehouse. And what disgrace will that be? I care not. It is better to be a cuckold than a windmill. If you meant to make me a fool, a, a poppy, or an ass of me, or any such Christian-like creature, it were another matter. But to be made a windmill of, and never to be respected, but, but when the wind blows, yeah, that's not to be endured. Therefore, let him make windmills of my weapons, if he will. For my own part, I'll defend myself with my heel. Do you come, 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 come. I have brought him to a better temper. He will come armed with nothing but a razor, with which, if he does slit your own pipe, it will not be amiss to take it patiently. Let him not spoil my drinking, and I care not. But hark you, if you shall let him hurt me, I, I'll be as angry as a tiger. Where is this slave that has provoked my rage to his destruction? I'll swinge this boar and hang him up for bacon in my chimney, and then send him to be broiled for Pluto's breakfast. What? Well, this is worse than to be made a windmill. Uh, yeah, here, sir. If, if ever you have the fit of an ague upon you, or ever knew the trembling of a man troubled in his conscience that would be loath to die, ere uh, he had made even with all the world, <laughs> consider me. Alas, sir, I, I have my rent to pay yet, and if I shall be sent to hell of an errand, They'll like my company so well, I shall never come back again. Pray, uh, pers persuade him to send me to Jerusalem or Jericho or any of those places near a hand. Why canst thou not excuse thyself? Where's thy brains? Alas, my brains have fallen into my breeches. But if you will stand between me and harm, I'll venture to, to, to reconcile myself to him. Um, Honest, cut beard. <laughs> Did, didst thou, didst thou not think I, I, I was in earnest all this while? Whatever thou wert, thou shalt be nothing presently. Death waits for thee. Come quickly, or come on, me. Persuade Master Death to have patience for a matter of forty or fifty years more. For I have a great deal of business to do in this world yet. Shall I be done with? Let me approach him. For all the entreaties of the world shall not preserve him past six minutes. One minute's passed already. <laughs> Thy own coward! 
cowardice and my heroic valour. Oh, mighty Hercules, I, I confess myself a pygmy, and I will never think otherwise while I live. Th these gentlemen shall be my witnesses. Why, then all is well again. Remember, copy it. Us? Give me thy hand, Jack. Thus do I grasp thy friendship. Did you grasp the devilish arm? Oh. I here pronounce thy wife to be a Venus. Oh, rare. Is she a Venus? That's more than I ever knew before. Why then, I will be her husband. Uh, Give me. No, Cupid was her son. But it's no matter for that. He shall be a husband for once. And we too shall uh, get such an abundance of young Cupids that will make all the world fall in love with one another. Since we are reconciled, no, honest swapper, I will make the whole world don't on me. I'll wash my face and powder thee to the purpose. And shave thee too, if thou wilt. No, no by, by no means. I dare not venture my throat under your fingers. But for washing and powdering, that all the world may be in love with me, well, I, I, I'm content. <laughs> And if thou 
thou leaves not stupid. Thou shalt say Jack Smogger is a king to kill. <laughs> well, Cuphead, thou hast to rest him handsomely. I give a crown that I were by when first he found what beauty he's adorned with all. <laughs> this day I am to meet pretty Parnell. Pray heaven the fool be absent when I come. Some two hours hence, if you will meet me, gentlemen, I will tell you how he takes his Transmigration. We will not fail. Farewell. <laughs> Oh, those same water rats are on deadly things. Well, what 
spoil what I to use in soul. What? Canst thou fear more harm in thy presence? Or away, milksop! Hence to thee, and all the other Nay, gentle Cornel, by this hand, I'll fight with a whole lot of thee if thou says the word. Pretty big way in soul. Show him 
of a wonder in Bartholomew Fair. Fetch me some more milk, this is all gone. By this hand, I'll go to the milk woman and fetch him a whole gallon. Civil mirth is gained with such small cost. 